We as a church, we as believers, we as individuals, we understand that our purpose, our primary objective, job one for us is to be disciples who make disciples. We get this very clearly from Jesus. Jesus commanded us to do this in what we call the Great Commission. We see in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, which Jesus tells his followers to make disciples of all nations, literally to make disciples of all people by gospeling, baptizing, and teaching. Gospeling just means to go and share the gospel where people are at. Baptizing, preparing new believers to be able to live out the basics of the Christian life. Teaching, that we pour into one another, that we help one another to see how the Bible is relevant in our daily life and, and how we can live it out in our daily life. This is to be our focus. This is to be our objective. This is to be the foundation of everything that we do. So the question is, why is it our focus? And the simple answer is, because that's God's focus. That's God's mission. God has an intentionality. He has a purpose. He has his mission. His mission is to draw all people unto himself, that all people would have a relationship with him. His mission is to make himself known. His mission is to grow those who have a relationship with him in deeper fellowship. His mission is actually to work through his followers to get it all done. It's our mission because it's God's mission. I like the way that Christopher Wright put it in his book, The Mission of God. He says this, the Bible renders and reveals to us the gods whose creative and redemptive work is permeated from beginning to end with God's own great mission, his purposeful, sovereign intentionality. All mission or missions which, are, which we initiate or into which we invest our own vocation, gifts, and energies flow from the prior and larger reality of the mission of God. God is on mission. And we, in that wonderful phrase of Paul, are co-workers with God. Listen, th this understanding of God being on mission it is not a New Testament concept. It's a biblical reality. It's something that we see through all Scripture. That God is drawing people to himself. That God is working to move people into a relationship with him. That God is working to reveal himself. That God wants to grow those who know him in a closer fellowship with him. And that God intends to use his people to get all this done. That's God's mission. And we see it throughout Scripture. So today, we're going to start the book of Jonah. And one thing that we'll see clearly in the book of Jonah is God's mission. That every one of these truths that God reveals what he's doing. So today we begin Jonah chapter 1, and in verses 1 through 16, we see in Jonah chapter 1, we see Jonah's disobedience and God's passionate pursuit of Jonah. Today we're going to look at this passage, and we are going to divide it up into four parts, and then we're going to see how all of this applies to each of us today. And what we will see, if you're a Christian, if you're a believer in this passage, is that even in your disobedience, God passionately pursues you to bring you back into fellowship with him so that you can be a part of his mission. Even in your disobedience, God runs after you. And today, if you're not a Christian, if you're not a believer, I think this passage will help you understand is that God loves you. And his love for you, he's revealed himself to you. And he's calling you to come to a relationship with him through faith in Jesus Christ. And today, he's inviting you again. So as we begin, let me give you a little bit of background. Let me give you a little, a little foundation for our passage. Uh, the book of Jonah is usually considered the fifth book in, in, a, in a 12 book set that we often call the minor prophets or even just the 12. 
A lot of times they're all considered together as one major message. Now they're often called the minor prophets and, and do know that they're called minor not because their message is less important. They're called minor because their message is shorter. It's shorter than the major prophets of Jeremiah and Isaiah and Ezekiel. The one neat thing about uh, Jonah then from the other 11 books that are in the 12 is that it's written as a narrative. Uh, the other works are generally collections of the prophet's messages, collections of what they said, but Jonah's different. It, it's a narrative of what actually happened to Jonah. Now, we know from 2 Kings chapter 14, verse 25, that, that Jonah was a prophet for the northern kingdom of Israel during the time of Jeroboam II, which probably places this somewhere between 782 and 745 B.C. We also know that Jonah is a prophet. Understand that biblically, a prophet is not somebody who tells the future. There's someone who just gives the message of God. A lot of times that message can be the future, but most of the time, it's the present. We need to understand that prophets were just really God's mailmen. That was their job. They didn't make the message. They didn't make it up the message. They went and told what God told them to do and to say. They were just God's mailmen. And that's important to know because as we start the book of Jonah, we're going to see Jonah, God's man, God's prophet, God's mailman, say no. Say, I don't want to deliver the message. So as we get into chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, we see Jonah's disobedience. At the very beginning, Jonah's disobedience is laid out that God's man, God's prophet, God's mailman is given a message by God to go to the city of Nineveh and deliver a message. And Jonah refuses. Now understand that Nineveh during that time period was the capital of the Assyrian Empire. Often in the Bible, they're used interchangeably. Nineveh and the Assyrian Empire are used to mean the same thing. And we know quite a bit about Nineveh and the Assyrian Empire. They are known for their wickedness, their cruelty, and their brutality. Nahum chapter 3 describes Nineveh as a city of blood and victims. It is a place that, that witchcraft and prostitution are put out openly for everyone to see. Its wickedness is far beyond what, what most of us would have imagined. We know that the Assyrian Empire was known for its brutality, its cruelty. When it would go in and conquer a city, uh, they would often take the survivors and impale them on stakes and leave them outside the city for everyone to see. They'd take the skulls of those they had killed and stack them up in pillars as reminders of who they were and what they were able to do. They were known during the time of Jonah for the cruelty and the brutality. And they were also the sworn enemy of Israel. They hated Israel, and Israel hated them. You need to understand that Nineveh makes Chicago and Los Angeles look like Mayberry RFD. Its wickedness was off the chart. And God tells Jonah, to go deliver my message. And in verse three, Jonah says, no. And more impressively, we see that Jonah leaves and he actually goes to the port city of Joppa and he goes to the ticket master there and he says, listen, I, I want a ticket for Tarshish. Little geographical lesson here. If Joppa is right here in the port of Israel, you would say that Nineveh, uh, the city you're supposed to go to, is in modern day northern Iraq, which, which had been to his east. And the city of Tarshish, as far as we can guess, would have been in the southern part of Spain, the farthest west that you could possibly possibly go. It is actually on the edge of known civilization at that time. It's almost like that Jonah went to the port city of Java and said, listen, what I need for you to do is give me a ticket as far west as I can get away from Nineveh. It was intentional. It was impressive. But also understand that, that Jonah knows that he can't geographically get away from God. He's not trying to outrun God. You, you, you can't skip town on God. So technically, he couldn't do it physically. But he was doing it spiritually. I, I like the way that theologian Gordon Ketty puts it. He says, the person who chooses to flee from God's presence 
is refusing to serve God in the task he knows that the Lord has given him to do. The matter is primarily spiritual and only secondarily geographical. And that is what we see in Jonah's place or in Jonah's case. Understand that by physically getting on a boat and going to the furthest parts west that he could possibly go, Jonah is saying spiritually, God, I'm not gonna do what you've called me to do. His physical actions are show that he's running away from God spiritually. They say no. Let me ask you, have you ever done that? I mean, truthfully, I doubt any of us have been sent to the the city of Nineveh. But has God specifically called you to do something? And you said no by your actions? Maybe he's called you to go have gospel conversations with your neighbor or your family or your coworkers. That he's told you to go and build a relationship to share Jesus Christ. And you go, yeah, I, I really don't know enough, or, or you know what, I just feel uncomfortable. It would make it uncomfortable. Maybe he's called you to forgive someone who's hurt you deeply. But you say, you know what, they wouldn't receive it, and really they haven't earned it. Maybe he's called you to grow deeper by praying and reading your Bible every day, to grow in that fellowship. And you go, you know what? I just, I'm not really sure that's gonna work and I, I really don't know where to start and I really, I really don't know where to begin and I'm not really sure that'd be effective anyway. Maybe he's called you to serve him and get more actively involved in the church and in his kingdom. And you say, well, you know what? I really don't have any gifts or abilities. I'm virtually a slug and I really can't offer anything. I don't have the time. Maybe later. Maybe through the Holy Spirit, he's called you to come to him through faith in Jesus Christ. And you're afraid of what people will say. Or you're afraid of how your life may change or what you have to give up. Has God ever asked you to do something specifically? And you've said no. You've run from him spiritually. Has God ever asked you to do anything? And you haven't. See, I think the truth is we're all more like Jonah than we like to admit. We turn back to our our text. We see in verses four through five, Jonah's wake-up call. Verses four through five, Jonah's wake-up call. That even though Jonah is running away from God, God runs after him. Look what it says in verses four through five. But the Lord sent out a great wind on the sea and there was a mighty tempest on the sea so that the ship was about to be broken up. Then the mariners were afraid and every man cried out to his God and threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten the load. But Jonah had gone down into the lowest parts of the ship, had laid down and was fast asleep. So Jonah's on the boat going to Tarshish and all of a sudden we read that a great storm, the word great is pretty important in the story of Jonah. He lets us see a lot of things that are going on, but a great mighty storm comes up onto the ship and is ripping this ship apart. And what we understand is that this ship is really special. Not the ship, but the the storm is really special. There's something going on with the storm And we find out that that literally in the Old Testament language, in the Hebrew, it says, Hatil Yahweh, or it says that God threw, God launched, God hurled the storm. This is the mother of all storms because God's the one who's sending it. It's not your normal storm. It's a real attention getter. And we understand it's an attention getter. Because these guys, these sailors, who are really, we think, very experienced at what they do, start freaking out. 
How do you know they're freaking out? Because they're throwing their cargo overboard. Let me tell you a little bit about shipping, and I don't understand it all, but I'm very clear on this. If you don't deliver your goods, you don't get paid. They're throwing out their livelihood because they thought they were gonna lose their life. And then more than that, these guys are crying out to God, any God, every God, his God. It didn't matter what they were crying out. They were just crying out for somebody to do something. Everybody's crying out to God except for Jonah, the man of God who's asleep. And he's asleep more than physical. He's asleep spiritual. And God has sent a storm, a wake-up call. Say, Jonah, look at what you're doing. You don't want to run from me. So often in our lives, when we've told God no, so often when we're running away from him, God will send a wake-up call. He will send a great storm into your life. He'll send something that you can't control to wake you up to what you're doing. Now, I want you to listen to me very careful because this is where most people go off the train tracks. Listen to the words I'm about to say. Not every problem in your life is a storm thrown at you from God. Not, N-O-T, not every problem in your life is a storm thrown at you from God. Some things we face in this life is just because it's a fallen world. It's common to everyone. It's going to happen. We need to understand this is not heaven. Second, Christian, sometimes God allows difficult things to happen in your life for the glory of his name. He works in our difficulties, our hardships, and our persecutions to glorify himself. It's not a wake-up call. It's God revealing himself to those around you. But sometimes we disobey God. Sometimes he tells us to do something and we say no. Sometimes we run away from God and God in his love for us, God because he cares for us, will send a great storm, a problem in our life that's too big for us to handle and he's saying, you don't need to do this. You wanna be with me. I like to call that harsh grace. It's harsh because it hurts. It's grace because he loves us and he does it for our good. Listen to what it says in Hebrews chapter 12, verses five through six, which is actually a quote from Proverbs chapter three, verses 11 through 12. And have you forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as the sons? My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor to be discouraged when he when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens, and he scourges every son from whom he receives. Sometimes we tell the Lord no, sometimes we walk away from him. He sends a great storm in our life. And what we need to understand, he doesn't do it because he hates us. He doesn't do it because he's trying to punish us. He's doing it because he loves us. And he knows that there is no joy apart from him. Today, are you going through a great storm? A problem that's too big for you to handle? Well, maybe in God's love, it's a wake-up call. It's him saying, you need to come back to my presence. As we turn back, we see in verses six through 10, Jonah's confession. Jonah's confession. Look at what it says in verses six through 10. So the captain came to him and said to him, what do you mean, sleeper? Arise, call on your God. Perhaps your God will consider us so that we may not perish. And they said to one another, come, let us cast lots that we may know for whose cause this trouble has come upon us. So they cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, please tell us for whose cause is this trouble upon us? 
What is your occupation? And where do you come from? What is your country? And of what people are you? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew and I fear the Lord. In the Old Testament language in Hebrew, it's I fear Yahweh, the God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. And when the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, why have you done this? For the men knew that he had fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. So the ship captain goes down to Jonah, kicks him away and says, dude, what are you doing? Get up. You need to do something. You need to do anything. You need to call on your God. Call on somebody. We're running out of options here. His ship is breaking apart. And so they do next what any rational person will do. They cast lots or throw dice to know the will of the gods. Of course, this is like playing Yahtzee. I mean, it's, it's, it's an awesome process. But do know that this really is something that was very common in this culture. They would often do this to know the will of the gods. So that really is not surprising. But what is surprising is that they ask the question, who's responsible It shows that they know that this storm is not an ordinary storm. They know that some God is doing this. Somebody is ticked off. So it's pretty cool they ask the question, who? But what I really think is amazing is that God actually worked in it. That God chose to reveal himself in the casting of lots. Of all probability, it fell on Jonah. That's God saying, yeah, buddy, I'm calling you out. And we know that these guys see it that way. Why? Because now they start 20 questions. Who are you? Where are you from? What did you do? What's your favorite Spice Girl? We need to figure out what's going on at this moment. I mean, it's just question after question. Jonah's response, though, calm, collected, straightforward. Hey, I serve the one true God. These, these other gods that you guys are playing with, <laughs> they're not really real. I serve the one true God. I serve Yahweh. He is the God over heaven. He created the land and sea. Everything that you see, he made. Everything bows before him. That's my God, and that's who I'm running from. I want to show you three truths that we can get from these verses about running from God. Three truths that we can get from running from God. Number one, you can run from God and still keep up appearances. You you can run from God and still say the right things and do the right things, but in your heart, you are rebelling against him. Jonah stands at the bait. He goes, hey, listen, I fear God. I worship the one true God. And then he says, I am running away from him. You cannot fear him. You cannot worship him. You cannot be following him and actually not obey him. How often do we come to a service on Sunday and declare how wonderful our God is, how majestic he is, and then on Monday tell him no? Number two, when you're running from God, it affects everybody around you. It affects everybody around you. You see, Jonah thought that this was about him and God, but when he got into that ship, into that boat, it affected the sailors. They were in the storm too. They were in the ravages of the great storm that God had through. They were not spared. So often when we run away from God, we think it's between us and God. But the truth of the matter is the great storms, the things that happen in life, it affects those who are closest to us. It affects our family and friends. Our disobedience spills out onto their lives. Number three, that when you're running from God, that unbelievers actually see the seriousness of it before we do. Unbelievers will get the seriousness of it before we do. We know in verse 10 that, that when Jonah came into the boat, a couple of the sailors go, dude, why are you traveling with us to Tarshish? I mean, I mean what are you doing? And Jonah just simply said, I'm trying to get away from my God. 
Listen, understand in this time period, they thought that gods were territorial, that they were gods over cities, gods over regions. So if you tick a god off, you just go somewhere outside of town where his power is no longer effective. That made sense. But now Jonah in verse nine says, hey, my God controls everything. My God made everything. Everything bows before him. And their response is, dude, what are you doing? How can you tell a God like that? No. Christian, how many times have unsaved friends and family members come to us and go, you're a believer, right? Are you supposed to act like that? Are you supposed to do that? Here's the reality, that in running from God and even in his own confession, Jonah was in a much worse place than if he had just gone to Nineveh. And what we have to understand that when we run from God, it's not better, it's not safer, and it's not happier. In fact, being out of God's will is the worst possible place you can ever be. Finally, as we turn back to our text, we see in verses 11 through 16, the sailor's response. We see the sailor's response. Look at verses 11 through 16 with me. Then they said to him, what shall we do to you that the sea may be calm for us? For the sea was growing more tempestuous. And he said to them, pick me up and throw me into the sea, then the sea will become calm for you. For I know that this great tempest is because of me. Nevertheless, the men rowed hard to return to land, but they could not, for the sea continued to grow more tempestuous against them. Therefore, they cried out to the Lord and said, we pray, O Lord, please do not let us perish for this man's life. And do not charge us with innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and threw him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice to the Lord and took vows. Storm is raging, it is getting worse. The sailors look at Jonah and go, okay, man, what do we gotta do? What do we gotta do to calm this thing down? And Jonah looks at them and he goes, you need to throw me overboard, which they were pretty sure there would be instant death for Jonah. I've heard people teach, I've read commentaries. Some people will lay out there that, that Jonah said, throw me overboard, knowing that God was going to save him. Honestly, I think that's reading a lot into the text. Personally, I believe that Jonah thought it was better to drown, it was better to die than go to Nineveh and deliver the message because I think that's what the rest of the text lays out. We don't know why. Jonah just knows, throw me overboard. It's because of me that this is taking place. And this is what gets really cool in the story because at this moment, the story stops being about God and Jonah and starts being about God and the sailors. We realize that while the sailors hear this, they're not good with that. They're smart. They know that this is because of Jonah. They know that this is a powerful God. And so they didn't want to tick this God off anymore. And obviously he's got some interest in Jonah. So they're like, no, we're going to try to row this out first. Get back to shore, put you off, and we're going to go our way. Storm gets worse. God's not going to allow it. And so now the sailors say, the only thing we can do is what Jonah has told us to do. We're gonna throw you overboard. But here is what's interesting, because in verse five, they are praying to each of his own gods. Whatever God they worship, they were praying to. In verse 14, they are praying to the one true God, Yahweh. And they're saying, oh Lord, don't hold us accountable for this sucker. That his blood is not on our hands. We get that he is special to you. But all we're trying to do is follow your will and make you happy. This is what's amazing that so far up into this story, everything's obeying God. 
The great storm is obeying God. The lost sailors are obeying God. The only thing that's not obeying God is Jonah, the man of God. And so they pick him up and they throw him overboard. And the storm stops. And they're awestruck, they're amazed. And verse 16 is a real powerful verse, sometimes kind of hidden. What it says literally in the Hebrew, in the Old Testament language, is that they feared with a mighty fear. They sacrificed sacrifices and vowed vows. You, you can hear the doubling. Feared with a mighty fear. Sacrificed sacrifices. They vowed vows. In the Hebrew language, when words are doubled, it's intensity. It's intentional. It's purposeful. See, these sailors had seen the power of God. They had seen the majesty of God. They had seen the hand of God. And all they could do was respond in the way that they understood. They saw his majesty because he revealed it to them. And all they could do was respond in the way they knew. They worshiped in sacrifices and they made vows to follow. God revealed, and they responded the only way they knew how. This morning, you may not be a believer, but if you're honest, you will admit that God has revealed himself to you in many ways and many times. That as you're looking at this, this creation, this universe that he's made, he's made you aware of who he is. That in difficult circumstances and other circumstances in your life, he's made you aware of who he is. And he sent people to talk to you about who he is. He has revealed himself to you. You know the truth. That he loves you. And that he made you to have a relationship with him, but you have rejected him because you have worshiped your own God. Just like the sailors. The difference is you are your God. You follow you, you follow your wants, you follow your desires, and because you're your God, you are separated from him forever, and you can't fix it. But Jesus, God the Son, in his love for you, died on the cross to pay for your rebellion to pay for your rejection. So if you stop running away from him and turn to him believing that only through Jesus you can be forgiven and rescued from this separation and reconciled to him, that is exactly what he'll do. Listen, if you'll be honest, you know that God has revealed himself to you. And that he is saying, come to me through faith in Jesus Christ. Today, like the sailors, you need to respond the only way you can. To worship and make a vow. What does that mean? It means to accept his offer and come to him through faith in Christ. That's the only way you can respond. Christian, over the years, I have been really, truly amazed that as, as some believers, they look at this passage and they say, you know what? Uh, if Jonah hadn't disobeyed God, then he never would have came in contact with these sailors and therefore God would have never revealed himself to his sailors. So God can work in my disobedience. So God is okay with my disobedience. Don't do that. Let me tell you what this passage doesn't do. It doesn't ever excuse our disobedience. Let me tell you what it does do. It reveals the grace and the mercy and the glory of God. That in all things, he will work for his glory, even in spite of us. I like the way Pastor and theologian R.T. Kendall puts it, he says this, you see, when God uses our rebellion for his glory, it do, he does not, he does it in such a way that it looks as though that was the way it was supposed to be. But that was never God's plan. God's grace and power 
never excuses the rebellious actions of those who refuse to do his will. Christian, do not confuse God's grace and mercy as his acceptance of your rebellion. A lot of times God works in spite of us. Do not confuse his grace and mercy. Do not sit there and say, God is using me. God is working through me. Therefore, he must be okay with me. Don't excuse. Don't confuse his grace and mercy as acceptance of your disobedience. So as we come to the end of our text and the question we always like to ask is how, how should we respond to what we've seen and what we've heard? How should we respond at this moment? And I believe that the simple way to respond is to stop running away from God. Stop running away from God. So what does that mean to you? Well, today, if you're not a Christian, if you're not a believer, it means to stop running away from him and to turn to him through faith in Jesus Christ. He's revealed himself to you. You know who he is. You know his offer. Accept it and come to him through faith in Christ. Just a few moments, we're gonna have what we call the invitation. It's just a time that you're invited to respond as the Holy Spirit is leading you to respond. And I do believe that the Holy Spirit makes it very clear in a way that we understand that we are separated from God because of our sin and our rebellion. And the only way we can come to him, the only way we can be restored to him is through faith in Jesus Christ. So during the invitation, we'll, we'll be standing, we'll be singing. I, I invite you at that time to step out from where you are and come down front. We'll, we'll be here. We would love to talk to you. We'd love to give you a vision of what it looks like when Christ is in your life, how everything changes. Well, Christian, what about us? Reality is, is that no one wants to run from God. No one wants to be running from God. But is that where you're at right now? Can you truly say that you've done everything that he's asked you to do? Are you having gospel conversations with, with those he's placed around you? Have you forgiven those who have hurt you deeply? Are you pursuing him in fellowship and growth through prayer and Bible study? Are you serving in the ways that he's called you to serve? Are you doing everything that he's asked you to do? Or have you just told him no? Christians, so often in our life, we'll sit there and we'll pray, God, help me at work. God, heal my family. God, bring revival to this nation. But you know what it really begins at? Is with us simply obeying him. Just simply do what he's asked us to do. Are you running from him? Today is the day to get off the boat to Tarshish and start making our way to Nineveh. As we come to the invitation, I, I encourage you. I encourage you to go before your king and ask the Holy Spirit and say, Lord, reveal to me anywhere that I've said no to you because right now my answer is yes. I am all in. Your will, your glory, your way. I don't want to run from you anymore. If you need help with that, altars available will be down front. You can pray with the person beside you. No matter who you are today, I encourage you, seek God the Spirit, listen to what he has to say, and act at this moment the only way that you can. Just say yes. Yes.